right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, If you've got a Bible this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, if you want to turn there, we'll have the verses on the screen, though. Um, To start, I want you to just do a little little mental exercise with me. Um, I want you to answer the question for yourself, when you think of having a good life, what pops into your mind? When you think about having a good life for yourself, what pops into your mind? What, uh, how do you spend your day? Where do you go? What kind of things would maybe be different about your life if you, you know, if it improved from where it is now? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, where, where a question like that can take us is, you know, all sorts of different places, right? We can uh, be thinking about the weather, you know, <laughs> apparently it's uh, muggy today and overcast, but that's pretty normal for Seattle, but where I'm from, this is a really bad day, and uh, so, I don't know, that's weird, or maybe you're thinking about, like, oh, I would never have to work again, or I'd only have to work on the things I want to work on, or I could do stuff, you know, my house would look a certain way, or, um, you know, I'd just be able to, you know, uh, maintain a certain level of health, but also just be able to eat whatever I want, or, you know, different things like that, right? These are all just possibilities that our mind goes to when we think about a good life that we might have. And last week, I said, uh, kind of last week and this week and then the following week, we're kind of using a, a question to kind of frame the passage we're in. And we're, we're asking the question, what makes us distinct as Christians? What makes Christians separate or different than the other options that are out there? And uh, we're going to kind of combine that with this good life question now. You know, we're going to look at what makes a good life in Jesus' mind for his disciples. And that's going to give us a dimension of what makes us distinct. So last week, we talked about kind of the, the who is part of what makes us distinct. You know, Jesus brought all these disciples together, and we kind of traced that trajectory through the Bible and saw that, wow, it takes a bunch of people who don't necessarily belong to each other and maybe are hostile to each other, but because they love Jesus, they become family together. And now we're going to enter into a section where he's going to talk a bit more about the what, the actions that we have. So the who is different, but also the actions that we have. And so we're in Luke 6, verse 17. Luke 6, verse 17. Uh, this section is called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, it's very similar to in the Gospel of Matthew. There's a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of a, an abridged version of that. Um, and, you know, because it's kind of a longer section, we'll kind of break it into two weeks. And so today is going to feel like we kind of just stopped in the middle of a sermon because we did stop in the middle of a sermon. But we'll pick it up again next week. But, you know, we won't, we won't reach its conclusion. But I wanted to slow down and kind of savor it a little bit. So we're jumping in at verse 17, Luke 6, verse 17. It says, And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd uh, of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea, Jerusalem, and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out of him and and healed them all. So we had, we had the disciples appointed as, uh, as apostles, and uh, you know, that was kind of a, a new Israel moment. He's kind of renewing Israel and kind of reestablishing uh, what he's do- He's using what God had done with Israel to kind of set the pattern of what he's doing, and he's establishing a new people of God. And so we now have kind of two groups of people who are, are gathered around Jesus. So we have the committed disciples, which represents the 12, but also kind of this larger crowd of people who are definitely following Jesus and are committed to him in a discipleship level. They've committed himself, themselves to him. But now you also have kind of crowds of people who are starting to gather around Jesus. We don't necessarily have like... Um, uh, how long has it been between, you know, when we first saw Jesus start his ministry to now? But he's, he's got a large crowd of people, and it's interesting because it's people from uh, Jerusalem are, you know, traveling all the way up to kind of the backwoods area to see this guy, um, Judea, which is kind of the, the region he's in. But then it says it's people from Tyre and Sidon. So word is spreading about Jesus even into the Gentile nations that, wow, there's this miracle worker, and there's this guy who's got some power, and there's this guy who's doing some different things, and they're all coming to listen to Jesus. And so you've got, um, you've got kind of these two audiences that are before him now, and you have the committed group and then kind of the curious group. And so then it says this in verse 20. It says, And he lifted his eyes and set them on the disciples and said. So we'll just pause there for a second. Because what this sermon is, is really Jesus laying out, this is my manifesto. This is what's important to me. This is what I want my disciples to be about. You know, it'd be very common for 
people who were rabbis in Jesus' culture to kind of have a, a whole system of thought that they would want their disciples to embody and take on and internalize and start living out. You know, if you, um, if you remember the verse where Jesus says, my, my yoke is light, you know, the yoke was a concept, uh, um, a metaphor for the teaching of a, of a rabbi. And so Jesus is laying out his teaching now, and he's looking at his disciples and saying, this is what I want you guys to be about. But it's also invitational to the crowd as well that, hey, if you want to be part of this movement, this is what we're going to be about as well. And so you have some people who have already committed to it and don't even know what they've committed to, and then some people who are finding out whether they want to commit to it. And then we'll just take one more word. It says blessed. So we'll pause there. Blessed, um, you know, so in English, we use the word bless in a number of different ways, right? If you sneeze, chances are someone will say bless you. Um, that's not what blessing means here. Or uh, if, you know, Jeff and I are talking and, uh, you know, he does something really nice for me. Oh, Jeff really blessed me today. You know, that, that's also not what we're talking about here. Those are just the kind of English words and way of using blessed. The word blessed here um, in Greek is makarios and in Hebrew is ashray. And that's kind of a, a larger category. It's a, it's a bigger idea. It kind of represents a, a whole composite of ideas. And, you know, we started with the question, what makes the good life? Because Macarius or Ashray kind of ask that question. It's saying, what is a good life? What is a flourishing life? What is an ideal life? And it invokes uh, Psalm 1. And so I'm going to turn over to Psalm 1 for a second and read you what Psalm 1 says. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So in Psalm 1, Ashrei, Makarios, is described as a person who meditates on God's law and avoids evil people and all these different things, and they become like this flourishing tree that does not wither, it has a water source by it, it bears fruit, all of those kinds of things. And so when Jesus opens his sermon with the idea of Makarios or Ashrei, he's saying, this is my version of Psalm 1. I'm going to describe for you what a flourishing tree looks like. I'm going to describe for you what a, uh, an ideal life is like, what a flourishing life is like. And if you can already see where this is going, it's not going to be what you think. <laughs> so he says this in verse 20. He says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for now you shall be satisfied. And blessed are you who weep, for now you will laugh. And so he opens up with this idea that being blessed, being ashray, having the ideal life is about being poor and hungry and mourning. It's not necessarily the things that our minds immediately jump to. It's actually things that we probably all try to avoid. You know, if someone is hungry or someone is poor or someone is in mourning, we would see those as problematic things to be going through. We would see those as things to be avoided or interruptions that shouldn't be happening, things that are not part of good lives. And yet Jesus is saying, that is actually the ideal. That is actually the flourishing. That is actually the thing that I want my disciples to be about and experience. And he does say, at some point that will change. You know, there will be a change that takes place, but for now, that's what he has for them. And then he, he, he goes on to say this in uh, verse 22. He says, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward in heaven is great, for so their fathers did to the prophets. And so he also names for these people that joining up with him is not going to lead to good things for you. Joining up with Jesus is not going to necessarily lead to an upward mobility or up and to the right. Because you have to imagine, most of the people here who have, are curious about Jesus or have signed up for Jesus, they're going, wow, this might really be the Messiah, and the Messiah is going to bring all these good things, and I'm getting in on the ground floor, and I'm getting close to the guy who's, you know, he's going to set up a new kingdom. And, you know, you kind of see that show up in the Gospels where people ask Jesus if they can sit at his right and left hand, and he's like, are you really aware of the cup I'm about to drink, and can you do the same thing? And, you know, and all those kinds of warning passages that show up that people thought this was a, a way to improve their station in life. And Jesus is saying, actually, it's going to lead to ostracization, it's going to lead to persecution, it's going to lead to uh, what people would normally consider 
bad things, things that would not be considered flourishing. And what Jesus is doing is he's saying to his disciples, our values are going to be totally upside down. What's important to me and my disciples and my movement is that things are going to be totally reversed. The things that culture values, the things that people typically go after, we're not going to be about those things. We're going to actually be about the opposite things. We're going to reverse what's important to us. And he's saying, this experience where you get uh, persecuted and bad things happen to you and things that people typically wouldn't want, that's actually part of the history of God working with people that you see it in the Old Testament, that you had all these prophets who were actually in tune with what God was doing, and the, the ancestors killed them or persecuted them or didn't listen to them or things like that. He said, this is just part of the experience of actually trusting God and actually walking with what God is trying to do. And then he says this in verse 24, but woe to those who are rich, for you have, been, you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you who are, uh, when people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. And he's saying all the kind of standard things that people would go after, you're actually, you should be, you're in woe right now. There is, be worried if you're experiencing those things. Be concerned if you're experiencing those things. And again, the whole point is just his manifesto, his teaching, his thing that he's going to be about in his movement and what he wants his disciples to be about is he's just reversing the values. He's saying our values are going to be totally upside down. The things that we're going to be about are going to be completely different than what people expect. And from here in the sermon, uh, he's going to lay out examples. He's going to lay out situations and say, okay, so if we're reversing things, what does it look like with this? What does it reverse like? What does a reversal look like with that? And we're just going to look at one of the sections now because I'm going to save the other ones for the next week. And so he says this in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from the one who takes away your goods and does not demand, takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish uh, that others would do to you, you do to them also. So he, he lays out some things, and he says, there's a lot of commands, there's a lot of imperatives, a lot of things you should do. He says, love, do good, bless, pray, turn the other cheek, give more to someone who took from you, give to beggars, and for people who steal from you, don't demand restitution. And treat everyone the way that you want to be treated, right? But it was all about people, you're doing those things to people who ultimately treated you badly, who were not deserving of it, people who did harmful things to you. And he's, he's reversing uh, something that happened in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, you may have uh, heard of a command like, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And in the Old Testament, that was actually a really revolutionary kind of beneficial uh, concept. Because in, in that time period, and for kind of every culture around then, and you know, really just human instinct, if someone does something bad to you, the thought is, I'm going to get them back, and I'm going to repay it more so. So if someone punches you, you're going to punch them twice. If someone punches you twice, well, now you've got to hit them four times, right? Like you keep upping the ante, and people get murdered, and people get killed, and people uh, have their houses burned down, and all that kind of stuff. And the eye for an eye concept was actually a limit on all that, and saying, whatever someone did to you, that's as far as you can take it back to them. And you're only going to take it as far as, what's, you know, as making it even. And that was revolutionary for that day, to put a limit on how much you could repay someone back. And now what Jesus is doing is he's saying, instead of just limiting the amount you can get back at someone, we're actually taking the limit off how much good you can do for that person. So someone comes at you and hurts you, and someone comes at you and abuses you, and someone comes at you and steals from you, and all these different things, and instead of getting even with them, we're actually going to the opposite direction and go, how do we bless that person? How do we pray for that person? How do we not demand restitution? How do we uh, enrich that person who just hurt us? That's where Jesus is taking it. That's where he's saying, hey, our values are going to be so different. You know, everyone else is going, hey, you know, we're going to just kind of limit uh, the, the restitution we can put back on someone who hurt us. For my disciples, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're not going to try and get restitution at all. In fact, we're going to try and enrich that other person. You know, you think of, um, uh, I should have looked it up, Les Miserables. I think that's how you say it. And uh, there's that scene where, um, I don't remember the guy's name, Jean Valjean. It's coming to me as I'm saying it. <laughs> and he's, he's stolen from the priest, and then he gets caught. And uh, the soldier brings him back and is like, this guy stole from you, I found all this stuff. And uh, the priest has some line about, like, John, I'm, I'm so disappointed. You were supposed to also take the candlesticks, right? And it's this picture of that kind of 
enemy love that Jesus is laying out for here, that someone stole, and they were willing to go, hey, we want to send you out with an even fuller basket. And he says this in verse 32. It says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For sinners do the same. And if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be called sons of the Most High, for he is, ungrateful, uh, he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. And so what Jesus does is he's saying, you know, typically people would only do good things to people who are already good to them people who are deserving of good things, people who uh, have done something to warrant receiving you know, your kind of kindness to them. And he's saying, actually, the way God treats people is God gives good things to people who don't deserve it at all. And that's what we're trying to embody. That's what makes our values different, is that we're following God's path in this world and taking people who hurt us, people who did bad things to us, and we're going to actually give good to them. And he kind of lays out this contrast of, you know, if you just look at the world, he goes, even, you know, bad people do good things for the people that they're close to. And so how much more should we, who are actually trying to be good people who are in tune with what God's doing and are part of God's family, actually do good to people instead? And he's saying, uh, he's saying, this is how we will be a new people of God. This is how we will be the new manifestation of God's people here on earth, is that we're going to take all the people who don't deserve it, all the people who do bad things to us, and just repay them back with mercy and kindness and blessing and just good. And that's what the reversal is. And part of Jesus' whole idea for his disciples when he's reversing the values, he's taking uh, situations with people and saying, my, people, my disciples are going to return evil with good. That's what's going to separate us. That's what's going to make us distinct. That's what's going to make us different, is that when you come across a Christian, when you come across a person who loves Jesus, you're going to discover a person that you can mistreat, and they will love you back. You can come across a person who you could strike, and they will own that cost and forgive you, right? Like, those are the kinds of values that Jesus is trying to lay out for his disciples. So we're going we're gonna to stop there in terms of the sermon for, for this week and just think about application now and just think about what does this mean for our lives. And like I said, there's more sections in this, um, and, and we'll read them next week. Uh, that's it's going to feel a little abrupt of a, of a stop right here. But uh, on the idea of flourishing, so I'm going to kind of take the two big sections and apply them. So on the idea of what does a good life look like? What does a flourishing life look like? What does uh, ashray look like for us? So... Uh, we talked about what it is, right? The poverty, the hunger, the uh, mourning, those kinds of ideas. We didn't really talk about why. And I actually want you to spend some time thinking about why does Jesus think those are good things for us? Like if you just spent some time this week just meditating on why would poverty or hunger or mourning be a good thing in Jesus' mind? Just spend some time meditating on that. that that's kind of a more uh, micro way to think about it. I want to look at a, a macro thing now. So, uh, the bigger question is, do our values actually align with Jesus' values? If Jesus has all these upside-down values and we're supposed to be following him, do we have those same upside-down values? There's a, a, a professor who's famous for, um, with his first-year students in their first class, when they all gather together, he, he gives them this survey. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a personality test sort of thing, uh, but it's kind of more extensive than that. And, he'll, you know, he'll ask them kind of the personality things like, are you extroverted? Are you introverted? Um, are you more thinking or feeling oriented? Those kinds of things. But then he'll, he'll, he'll move it into, um, this is a Christian professor, so you'll see why in a second, uh, kind of how they're thinking about things. And so he'll ask them, what are your theological beliefs on, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism, you know, uh, spiritual gifts versus they don't exist anymore, you know, all the different things. And then he'll, you know, he'll get kind of more, uh, more cultural, and he'll, he'll ask, hey, what did you think about, um, you know, this political issue right now, or this uh, thing in the news right now, who, you know, who would you vote for, all those kinds of things. And so he'll kind of get the whole composite picture, and then he'll give them the same survey on the same day, and go, hey, I want you to fill out that same survey for Jesus, and give me the answers that you think Jesus would answer for those questions. And 90% of the time, uh, you have the person who filled it out for themselves, and then they filled it out for Jesus, and they're the exact same. <laughs> it's the, they have taken Jesus and saw themselves in Jesus. And what ends up happening, and the point of the, the initial lecture, is that rather than making ourselves into Jesus' image, we're often making Jesus into our image. 
And we're often thinking Jesus is just like us and not actually being challenged by the things that Jesus has for us. And we think that Jesus just thinks exactly like us. And, you know, he goes on from there to go, how do we get outside ourselves, get outside our own kind of self-deception about what Jesus is like and get some perspective and go, what is Jesus actually like? You know, and, and in the context of his classroom, he goes, hey, we've got some, some people here who earnestly believe, you know, this end of the questions, and they all love Jesus. And we've got some people over here who also are loving Jesus and thinking completely different than that group of people. And so what can we learn from each other? What slice of Jesus is this side seeing that this side is not seizing, and vice versa? And, you know, the point being is that, you know, when Jesus is taking hostile groups of people and putting them together, they're able to come in and have different perspectives and notice different things about Jesus. And that there's a benefit in having that diversity together and going, wow, I didn't realize that about Jesus. What are you seeing? Oh, I didn't realize that about Jesus. And that community dynamic is able to enlighten us into seeing, oh, there's, there's still ways that I have to grow. I thought Jesus was just like me. I realized, actually, he's a bit more like you, and I have to learn some things. So I am, uh, uh, the, the church I would say that I got saved in, I, I had gone to a Christian elementary school and kind of learned some things about Jesus, but the, where I would say I really started becoming a follower of Jesus is a, a church that's in the denomination called the Christian Missionary Alliance. And that's, you know, kind of a weird name, it is what it is. Um, and I can't speak for everybody's uh, experience with the Christian Missionary Alliance, but for me, I had a pretty good experience with them. And uh, it's, a, it's a much bigger denomination on the East Coast and Midwest than it is the, the West Coast. But the, the basic premise of the CMA is that they will take all their money for missions and pool it together. And then they'll send their missionaries out, and the missionaries don't have to raise support. And so that, that's the ultimate purpose of the denominations, just to send missionaries and make it so that they don't have to raise support. But so then because of that, they're not really kind of legislating like how to think about different theological differences or different ways to do church or different things like that. And so then when you come to, uh, you know, like their kind of conferences for the pastors or whatever, you will have people who are hardcore speaking in tongue charismatics and then people who don't think any of that's real worshiping together and doing ministry together because the ultimate purpose is to send missionaries. You know, you'll have the people who uh, are like so God's sovereignty that like God ordained that I had a ham sandwich this morning. And then you have the people who are on the other end that God's not involved in anything. <laughs> and they're on the same team doing ministry together. And so, you know, I, I became a Christian eighth grade, early high school, that kind of season. And so that's what I thought how, how Christianity is. is you, oh, okay, we've got a goal and, you know, kind of, you know, my church was very good at kind of going, well, lots of Christians think this, lots of Christians think that. You kind of, you know, here's the boundaries, that kind of thing. You know, so I thought that's how everybody does it. And then I went to Christian college and found, oh, that's not really how anybody does it. <laughs> There's, you know, you meet these people who, if you don't think exactly like them, they don't think that you're a Christian at all. And again, it's, kind of missing the dynamic that actually God may have brought you in this path and given you these views and given you this kind of conviction because you're seeing one thing about Jesus and this other person who's kind of on the other end of it is seeing a different thing and you actually have something to benefit from learning from each other. So when I, I was in Christian college, and this is kind of a, a few years down the line, um, there was a, a class that I was in where uh, for one lecture, they, they broke us up into denomination. And so, um, you had me and this guy, Aaron, who were part of the CMA, and then you had uh, the Charismatics, and then you had the Baptists, and then you had the non-denominationals. And so then once they got you at your table with your people, they said, okay, I want you to answer the question, what is spiritual maturity? What does a mature Christian look like? And so uh, the Charismatics had kind of, their whole answer was, um, different experiences. You've experienced this, you've experienced tongues, you've experienced a miracle, you know, whatever it is. But it was kind of experiential. The Baptists were all a list of don't do this. <laughs> so don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then uh, the non-denominationals had this kind of like, how much is the church, you know, using your week? And so, you know, your initial person just shows up on Sunday, then they maybe go to Sunday school, then they get involved in a small group, then they serve some, you know, it's kind of just this, like, is how many hours is the church taking up? And then me and this guy, Aaron, you know, because eldership was a really big thing in our church at that moment, we're just talking about elders. And the point of the lecture was like, hey, if you're just in a room and around a table with people just like you, you may have some good things that you're noticing, but you're not noticing everything. And so we actually have to learn from each other that these people have some things to offer and these people, and we all have different things of Jesus that we've gotten to experience, but it's in the coming together that we get the full picture. And so when we're thinking about how do we get outside ourselves and, we're, and make sure our values actually align with Jesus' values, you're not gonna be able to do it on your own. You're going to need people in your life who are different than you, 
but also close enough to you relationally to speak into your life. I don't know. Okay. Seems like they're moving away. <laughs> Do we need to send someone outside? Um, okay. So that, that's kind of the first concept uh, at a macro level to apply. Let's go on to the last one, which is about the, the loving our enemies. So again, remember, we, it was love your enemy, bless those who persecute you, pray for those that abuse you, turn your other cheek, all those kinds of things. Are any of those things hard things to do? Yes and no, right? Kind of depends by what you mean by that. All of us can pray. All of us can turn the other cheek. All of us can bless someone. All of us, that if someone steals from us, cannot go back and try and demand restitution. But on an emotional level, how easy is that to do? It's really hard, right? Like if you think about the person who's hurt you the most or the person who's hurt you the second most or you just go down the list of people who have hurt you in your life, do you actually find yourself wanting to do those things? And the answer is probably not, right? And so Jesus has laid out some things that are very tangible for us to do and yet are very difficult to do, right? And that's kind of the tension point there, is that Jesus has not made commands that are so impossible. Sometimes you'll see with the Sermon on the Mount, people will go, you know, the the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is to go, wow, I really need Jesus. He doesn't really want me to do these things. He's just making me realize, like, how hard it is to follow him. And I'm a fan of this author, uh, Sky Jatani, who goes, I think Jesus was actually serious about that. He has this whole book, What If Jesus Was Serious About the Sermon on the Mount? And the point being that, no, I think when Jesus gives these commands, he actually wants people to do it. You know, when you have an enemy or you have someone that hurts you, I think he wants you to pray and bless those people. And so we have to learn how to do it. And the root is in, we have to see that God first loved us. God was first merciful to us. Unless you understand how much God has forgiven you, you'll never find the strength to do it to someone else. And that's where this all starts, is recognizing God first forgave me, and God is first operating in this world, taking sinners, broken people, people who have not followed his commands, and loving them, and restoring them, and showing grace to them. And if I've experienced that, I need to be willing to give that to someone else who did that in my life. And that is how we end up being distinct. That is how we end up being different. That is how we end up being a people who are different. I'm going to close with uh, another passage, but you'll see where this is going. There's a, there's a moment where uh, Peter comes to Jesus uh, later on in the Gospels. We haven't got there yet. But he asks Jesus, how many times should I uh, forgive someone? Seven times? And Jesus says, not uh, seven times, but seven times 70 times. And that's not his way of saying 490. That's his way of saying there should be no limit, right? You should be, always be willing to forgive someone. And I had a professor who uh, his insight on that passage was that it's maybe not so much that uh, you know, someone in your life needs 490 forgivenesses. It's that when someone has hurt you, you may have to forgive that person 490 times to really have arrived at forgiveness for that person. And so what he would say is he would, he would say, let's say someone hurts you, and then you go, okay, well, I need to forgive this person. And you, you, you resolve to forgive the person, and a half second later, you're angry again. You know, and you know, I gotta forgive this. And you keep doing that. And over time, there starts to be a a distance between how quickly you were willing to forgive and how quickly you became angry again. And then you keep doing that, and over time, you find yourself becoming neutral towards the person. You know, and then you uh, are in church one day, and a pastor says, you know, a really good way to learn how to forgive someone is to pray for them. And so then you're like, well, okay, I'll pray for this person who was a jerk to me. And then you start praying for them. And now you're angry again, and you're also angry at the pastor for saying that. And you know, the whole thing is kind of resetting, but that, you know, that's a separate thing. But you stick with it. And eventually, as you pray for that person, you find yourself actually praying. Uh, you're, you're becoming neutral towards them. But then you're eventually finding that you are praying good things for that person. And you actually want good things for that person. And now you're kind of midway through the forgivenesses. You're, you're at 300. You're at 400. And you're starting to find yourself having empathy for that person and realizing, you know what, they may have hurt me, but they're also just a broken person who's doing the best with their brokenness. And you're starting to have grace for that person. And you keep committing yourself to the process, and by the time you get to the end of it, you have fully resolved the hurt, and you have fully resolved the pain, and you have a total disposition of forgiveness to that person. But you have to commit yourself to the process. Right? You have to go through the entire steps. And if you don't, it will just become bitterness. It will just become this thing that just resides in you and controls your life. There's an a author, Anne Lamont, and she says, uh, bitterness is like us drinking the rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. And that's how most of us are with our forgiveness, is rather than actually going through forgiveness, we're living with the poison in our lives and letting it consume us. 
But again, if we are Jesus' followers, we commit ourselves to having a different set of values. And that different set of values is something that is process-oriented and works out in different ways. And so the thing becomes, how do we start that process? How do we start there? And it, you know, uh, it just starts with understanding what God did for us first. Right? That's how the Bible portrays all these things. You understand the cross, you understand Jesus, you understand what God did for you. You will find the Spirit putting the power within you to start moving you in that direction. But you have to start with what God did for you first. Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll worship. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, uh, honestly, some difficult sayings, Lord, but we thank you that you're the kind of God who has those difficult sayings. And as we all find ourselves as uh, broken people who uh, need forgiveness, Lord, we, find, we ask that in that forgiveness that we've received, you would give us strength to forgive those who have hurt us. And we pray that uh, this good life that you have for us, this flourishing life for, that you have for us that looks so different than what we would want for ourselves, Lord, we would learn to desire it. We would learn to crave it. We would learn to embody the things uh, that you are about as we are in your disciples. In your name, amen.